Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Starting to Homeschool webinar series. This is the fourth of our webinars with our special guest and instructor, teacher, Pat Ferenga. Pat is a homeschooling dad as well as an author and speaker about homeschooling, unschooling, and the work of John Holt. Pat published Growing Without Schooling magazine from Holt's death in 1986 until 2001. He continues to speak and write about all the ways that we learn without using standard school techniques and how a civil society is better advanced by non-compulsory learning. Pat, thanks for doing this. So looking forward to this hour. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. I'd like to get back. Um, I've taken you through the steps of whether, you know, deciding should I homeschool and then, you know, choosing the sort of curriculum that, that you would use at home or creating your own, using self-directed learning, how to report that and apply to it, apply to, you know, if you have to apply for homeschooling, um, you know, in your state. And now you're at home. You've chosen some materials. You've got an idea of a direction you want to go in. And, you know, what do you do now? In, in my last session, I, I covered, you know, a lot of the academic end of that. But then there's the, the real issue of, you know, the interactions with your children on a daily basis. And, and that's where I want to have as much space as I can allow in this presentation for your questions. Um, you know, among the, the, uh, the primary questions that, that I, I get um, that I've noticed over the last 30 years, uh, in my homeschooling work, is what do we do during the day? <laughs> you know, if we're not using a curriculum, because most curriculums will actually tell you what to do and when to do it. You know, you know, some of them even tell you when to turn the page and when not to turn the page. And if you like that sort of thing, okay. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, there is, we all know how to do that if you went to school. And if your children were in school and now they're being homeschooled, they may not want to do more school at home. And in fact, one thing that many homeschoolers have noted uh, ever since I got started here in 1981, I heard this phrase, um, it's either decompression or de-schooling. You have to give your child decompression time or de-schooling time once they leave school. You shouldn't really like just throw them back into school at home because within a couple of weeks they may be saying, What's the difference? I may as well go back into school or at least have a couple of people that, you know, will share my agony. <laughs> but um, what, what homeschoolers realize is that time is on our side. So we can let our children relax, decompress. And a rule of thumb that I've heard repeated many times, but I first heard it back in the 19, 1981 from uh, some homeschooling parents, is for every year your child was in school, they need at least a month to decompress and to de-school. And by this I mean get used to the idea that they're actually going to have a say in what's going on with their education. That they can actually trust you as their parent, not to boss them around like a teacher. That they can actually live in their home comfortably and not feel that their home is a school. Now, if you do set your home up as a school, I know parents who create a classroom in their home and, and set up and if that's working for you, great. If it's not broke, do not fix it. I know that everyone tends to teach the way they were taught, and if everyone is comfortable with that in your family and it's working, no problem. You know what to do and you're doing it. But if it's not working for you, you know, there are many other options, and this is where the de-schooling process comes in. So you let your child relax. They may want to just watch... TV a lot. They may want to play computer games a lot. They may want to read a lot. They may want to be alone or do sports or, or do nothing. You know, they need to decompress. They've been, you know, particularly if they've had a bad schooling experience. You know, I mean, if it's not that traumatic, if it hasn't been that bad for them, this may not take more than a couple of days or weeks. Some kids may be ready to start the, the very next day, but most kids need a little time to decompress. As do the fam, the families. Don't forget, your family's been under stress too from school. So take the time to relax together. And then when you feel that you know, you've got the time to, um, 
you know, when the break starts to diminish and the kids begin to feel ready for more activity and focus, you know, you as a parent might have a hard time working with them because you're just going to say, all right, let's do this, let's do that. And they're going to say, nah, I don't want to, no, no, no. A much better way to do this um, was suggested um, years ago in Grow Without Schooling magazine. And uh, the editor at the time, Susanna Sheffer, uh, wrote about it. And um, her suggestion is, and, and, I, and I urge you to do the same thing, and this is something I've, I've actually heard some alternative schools do too. Um, rather than um, create a curriculum, sit down and say, let's make three lists. Let's talk about the things that come easy to you that you would do anyway, whether or not you sat down and made a plan for them. So just list those things. Then the next list, the second list, would be the list of things that you want to work on but feel that you need some help with. You know, maybe suggestions of ways to pursue the activity, or maybe some sort of schedule or plan regarding the activity. And then the last list, the third list, is for things you want to put aside for a while, things you don't want to work on right now. You know, you can imagine what those, how those lists would come be, like for a third grader versus an eighth grader versus a twelfth grader. It'd be quite different. But the value of these lists, and now this is, uh, these are the words of Susanna here. The value of these lists, it seems to me, is that they show kids, one, that they are already doing worthwhile things and don't need outside intervention for everything. That's list one, things that come easy. Two, at the same time, it's perfectly okay to want, to help, in some, to want help in some areas. To have a list of things that you want to do, but aren't sure that about how to do them. So that's list two. And then list three, it's also okay to put some things aside for the time being. And this may be especially important to kids who have had bad experiences with particular subjects in school and who would benefit from realizing that they have much more control in their new situation. Fourteen year old hey, Yes. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm not seeing the slides, or I was just seeing your your picture. Oh, so we make sure that we actually see the slides. So I'm going to stop talking and see if the slides come back. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me see. Let me. It does say I'm screen sharing, Steve. That's odd. Um, let me start it. Try screen sharing again. Then. Uh -huh. Let's see. Are you seeing that now? So, uh, weirdly, I am not, although it appears in the lower box, but it doesn't appear on my main screen. Now, maybe somebody in the audience in the Q&A can let us know if you're seeing the slides, and if you are, then we're in good shape. <laughs> but um, I'm not seeing the slides. Is your camera on? Yes, it is. And are you seeing yourself in the main room? Um, not when I'm looking at the slides. When I call up the uh, Google Hangouts, what I'm seeing is the slides in the lower right. And if you turn off the the desktop share, do you see a uh, your image in the big on the screen? Yeah. Well, I see myself little down there. <laughs> but but not on the main screen. No, not on the main screen. That's right. That's interesting. Well, oh, now I am on my main screen. Do you see me now? Again, I don't, and I'm hoping uh -huh. someone will, will pull up the Q&A chat and put a note in. We do have okay. live online, and you can ask it in the form of a question. Mm -hmm. Just tell us if you're seeing Pat's slides. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for the feedback. And, um, well, it's important you were so, so well prepared, and we had everything going, but I am not seeing your slides or your image. Boy, that's strange. I was working just before we started this. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, um, and I do see in the small view down at the bottom, I am seeing your your um, your first slide, but have you moved on from the first slide? Yes, I have, and I'm on slide two. Huh. Okay, we'll take a quick pause here. So, uh, up at the top of the screen, Pat, there is a camera on and camera off button. Yeah. 
Would you turn your camera off and then turn it back on? All right. It's off. It's on. Yeah, and I'm seeing the photo of you. I think Google's having a problem. So let's do this quickly. Let's have you log out and log back in again to the Hangout. Okay. Um, so you, you, have, you should have the link from Rochelle. Yep, I do. So go ahead and log out. Sorry, everybody, but I think there's a little bit of a, a Google glitch here. And Google we glitch. To, we want you to be able to see the slides and see Pat. Okay. Oh, somebody says they're seeing the slides just fine, so maybe it's me. Ah, thank you for the feedback. <laughs> okay, so I think it must be me. So you don't have to log out. Okay. Um, and hopefully that means they're seeing you as well. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm going to go back to the slide. Okay, so do you just keep going, and I'm going to log out and see if I can come back in. All right, let's see. All right, so to finish up on this third point, um, Susanna was writing about this 14-year-old girl, Marianne, and she was very empathic, uh, emphatic about putting essay writing on list three because she had very unpleasant and discouraging experiences with essay writing in school. And for her at that time, having control meant being able to say, I choose not to work on that right now. And Marianne's list, too, was the longest. And that's probably going to be the true for most kids. Um, and Susanna writes, ultimately, this list may be the most important because it's the one from which ideas and plans can grow. It's very important to realize that much of what you're doing already has educational value. School doesn't usually give kids credit for the things they willingly and eagerly pursue on their own. But it's just as important for the new homeschooler or the longtime homeschooler who's looking to make some changes to realize that it's fine to need help and to ask for it. So that's one of the great things about, about you know, taking de-schooling, taking the time off, you know, um, let, to let things percolate and settle down, and then to um, figure out a plan, to, to actually work with your child and, 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 and see what it is that, you know, that you want to do. Um, another aspect of this that I think is important and that schools don't talk about, but parents know, and, and certainly a lot of teachers know this, uh, and, and certainly I would say philosophers, religious people, and so on, and that is you need to give children, any people, not just children, children and adults, time and space to develop their inner lives. And, you know, that includes their fantasy lives, and that includes play. And allowing that to happen is really important and really hard to do because we don't see that in school. And we probably weren't trusted that much ourselves as children to do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's really like we have to make an effort to trust that what's going on is, is a valuable thing because you can't see someone develop it in their life. <laughs> you can't give them a test. And their fantasy life, well, that's their business. You know, I mean, they may share it with other kids, and they often do, and they may share it with you. Uh, Growing Without Schooling magazine, and uh, in fact, just about any book that talks about homeschooling and watching kids, it's going to note the fantasy play that the children are doing in it, you know, in and out of the home. So don't don't neglect that. Now, another thing that I, I think is a little counterintuitive on all this. Um, oh, I forgot to hit the other button first. Let me screen share again. And that is not to get locked into the idea that you need to do everything at home or that it has to be an official homeschooling, unschooling event, you know. Um, there are many places and many people that your children can learn from. And one of the great things about homeschooling and unschooling is that it forces you as a parent to break out of that mold because you know you could talk yourself blue in the face trying to get into that school so your child could take you know baseball be on the baseball team for instance but another option you know you can find out that there's a group called the American Athletic Union in your neighborhood and join their league or if there's enough homeschoolers you could do like homeschoolers in Colorado have done and they've actually formed their own homeschool baseball leagues so you don't have to rely solely on your home and solely on your school. 
uh, this past weekend I was at a, a, an alternative education conference in Long Island called Arrow. And um, at Arrow, there's a lot, a lot of interest in learning centers and learning co-ops and alternative schools that work with homeschoolers or that provide services. There, there's a growing awareness that there, there's a lot that, that what homeschoolers want and unschoolers in particular want is not more curriculum. We don't need more Pearson tests. We don't need more Macmillan textbooks. We don't need you know, more, more of what we've all had since we all went to school way back when. What we want are experiences for our kids. We want our kids to have positive relationships, thing, you know, uh, endeavors that, that excite them and that are big and bold, that, that, that make them proud to join them and be part of them and to, and to work with other children. And so thinking outside the box, thinking not just, oh, oh you know, my kid's, you know, being homeschooled now and um, I've got a, and I hate math, so maybe I should just, you know, get them a math course or, te or enroll them in the local homeschool co-op for a math class or learning center or take them to a community college or get them a tutor. You know, another option is not to teach them math right now. What, what are they interested in now? You know, yeah, you're going to run the risk that they're going to be a little behind in their math or very behind if this goes on for more than a year, but they can catch up. I can't tell you, just like with late reading. So many kids learn all the math they need to know just as they learn all the reading that they need to know when they're ready. Um, there's, there is research that supports this, not a lot on the math side, but there is some, and, and there's a lot of evidence, uh, not, not just from homeschooling, uh, the Benizé experiment, um, I forget where it was, it was somewhere in New England, was, was a great example of this, and that was in the 1930s. There are so many great examples of, of how, by not constantly instructing children, children actually learn better. Um, I, I've actually written written about that in Teacher Own and other places, as as other people. And um, Dr. Peter Gray now has a, a wonderful thing in Psychology Today, uh, the website that came out last week about how early academic instruction actually harms children, reduces their intellectual capacity, citing many many studies going back 30 years. So don't think that you need to turn your home into a school or make your unschool into a non-stop series of wonderful experiences and joyful enterprises. It's okay to just have a normal life and to sit down and relax with your children and to have your children sit down and be comfortable too. Everyone needs to learn to have some inner peace and some inner space and an inner life. And this is how we can help our children do it. Again, you know, all too often when you're home with, with your, your child, we start comparing ourselves, you know, to them, uh, to others. We start saying, oh, you know, my, my child is having difficulty learning math, but, you know, gosh, the Jones child, you know, who I, I know in the next neighborhood who, uh, you know, my, my son's friends with, he's using Singapore math, and boy, I don't think my child could get, could get through the first page of that. You know, this is terrible. Maybe, maybe my, my son has some sort of, you know, mathematical disability or dyscalculia, <laughs> whatever they're going to call it, you know, um, and don't, don't do that. That's a school problem. If a kid isn't up to a certain grade you know, uh, thing in school, the teacher can't say, take your time, you'll get it later, we can address it over the summer, or maybe uh, next year we'll remediate it, you know, you'll focus on other stuff, you know, that's not the way it works in school. You know, they have to you know, make a diagnosis if the kid's not there because their job is on the line. If this child doesn't learn, they, they could possibly get a, a salary cut now. It's a terrible situation teachers are put in. So, yeah, they're, they're more prone to say, oh, you should see a specialist for this, um, you know, to get them out of the class and, and out of their responsibility for this. But the fact is, not, a, not every difficulty means that it's a disability. We get so hung up on, on children, you know, being you know, malfunctioning uh, educationally, when so so much of it is really not dyslexia, it's dysteachia. You know, we're not teaching to the children's needs. You know, but no one, it, it's hard to say that. But at home, you can. So, don't rush to a, a school expert if your child is not doing something up to what you think they should be doing. 
you know, go. I would look at the homeschooling literature. Certainly, talk to other homeschoolers and unschoolers. Find out like what 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 their experience was, and you're going to find it's a variety. And if anything that that you get out of this series, I hope it's that <laughs> it, there's a variety. You know, it's not like you know fifth grade, fifth month. This is exactly what you're doing, and if you you are, you're late or early. What does that mean? It's like, you know, when they say, like, a, a pregnant woman is late or early. It's like, on who's scheduled? It's the doctor's schedule, you know? The baby is not late or early. The baby's born when the baby's ready to come out, you know? And same thing with reading and same thing with math, you know? So t relax on, on these things as, as much as you can. Because I know it gets stressful when you're trying to do something different than the uh, mainstream. But... Accepting different scopes and sequences for learning can can actually be a, a liberating experience. It'll it'll relax you, you know. Uh, so be learning learning some patience about this, and don't think that any time your child is having a problem reading, writing, calculating, socializing, that this means that they need to have some sort of you know medical or educational intervention. Patience, be aware. Do check their health, of course, their mental health, their emotional health, their eyesight, their physical health. And as long as there's no problems, don't rush to judgment on them. You know, if your child wants to, you know, because this happens a lot. Kids spend a lot of time, you know, when they're not forced to learn, to play like on computers. You know, I, I heard the keynote speaker this week weekend was uh, Sugata Mitra, uh, who writes, is doing all this work with computers and kids, and how he doesn't instruct kids on how to use the computers, just puts them in front of the computers and sees what happened. That takes a lot of patience. Sometimes he, he allowed two months for one of his experiments. You know, it's okay. You know, you don't need to rush these things. In school, they rush them, but they have, and, the, and that's because of their reasons, you know, but we don't, we have different reasons for this. Um, another big question that comes up a lot is finding friends, you know. Some homeschoolers are naturally um, gregarious, and you know you, you've met these young young people, these young boys and girls who can talk to anybody. They're the interpersonal learners. They love they love to communicate with with different ages and different people, and everyone likes likes them or or, or is attracted to them in some way. And and you know everyone wishes that their child was like that, but you know not every kid is. You know, and shy children in particular, <clears throat> you know, might have some difficulty with homeschooling in the beginning um, if there's not a, a ready group out there. Um, and sometimes even if there is a ready group, um, you know, I live in, in Massachusetts, in Boston, in the Boston area, and there's a lot of homeschooling groups up here. And I'm still aware uh, of, of families, including at one point uh, one of my children, who couldn't connect with anybody there. But the important thing is, you keep looking for friends, you know, and your friends are not your age mates. This is another school concept we have to let ri get rid of. You know, your fifth grade age child can be friends with a six-year-old and a 12-year-old and even a teenager and an adult, you know. And one of the greatest examples of this that I found was this talk that you're seeing on the screen. It's called How World of Warcraft Saved Me in My Education. This young man was not homeschooled. His parents, for whatever reasons, he didn't do it. But it's a very dramatic story to me because he was suicidal. He was in the hospital over how much he hated school and how, how poorly you know, he, he was doing socially in school. But where he found himself and his friends was in the world of Warcraft. And he found out that he not only was he good at it, but he became a guide and he would organize expeditions and adventures and what he discovered when he started to chat with these people offline is that many of them were adults and were much older than him and they became very important friends of his and most importantly of all it gave Eric a sense of purpose and it helped him get over his deep depression and you know again and I believe it was a teacher in his school who, who recommended that that he go out and, and, and do this TED talk um, you know, to let people know that you know playing computer games is not necessarily a dead end, you know, antisocial uh, negative experience. 
for him, it was a life-saving experience that gave him a whole bunch of friends. So, you know, d don't neglect the modern world. <laughs> you know, don't think that your children are only going to find friends if, if they go out, you know, as me and my brothers were talking over the weekend, to, you know, as we grew up in the Bronx, we often found our friends by playing kick the can or stickball in the street. Nowadays, they're finding them on the internet. You know, um, you know, most parents would be terrified to let their their children play stickball and, and hit a three sewer triple. <laughs> yeah. But um, you can let them get online if you feel feel better about that. But you can also let them go outside and play. You know, we have. I, I think that that's important. But finding friends, it's really important to, to realize it's not just their age mates or other homeschoolers. It's people who share their same interests. If your child is interested in origami, those you know, find people who do it. They can become his friends. If your daughter is into fashion, as so many uh, young ladies are, you know, certainly all three of my, my daughters were at one point, you know, they're all making designs and sewing and making their own outfits. Wonderful. You know, there, there are many opportunities for them to meet people who want to share that interest and work with them. So don't, don't think that finding friends only means having children the same age with your friends who are, or doing the same work or using the same homeschool curriculum or are just or unschoolers. Um, another way to do it is to make your home a place where the neighborhood children are welcome. Invite other ch homeschoolers during the day to play with your children. And oddly enough, what my wife and I have found, when you do that, you get time. Because the kids are so busy negotiating and talking amongst themselves that they really don't need you. <laughs> you can just keep a, a watchful ear out, but get on with your life and do something else. You know? Um, and, and what happens is, like, when children have multi-age friends, at least in homeschoolers, we found some very interesting things. I, I'm aware of an Irish uh, homeschooler. His name is Eric Lassard. I don't know how old he is now, but there was a YouTube video of him, and he's eight years old, dressed in a suit, giving a self-improvement talk. Why is that? Well, it turns out his parents loved to go to self-improvement workshops, and they were taking him as a kid, and he just absorbed that like a sponge, and he's as good as Tony Robbins in many ways. So he could do, you know, do that sort of stuff. Um, Grant Colfax worked with dairy goats on, on his family's farm. Who would have guessed that that would have turned into a pre-medical uh, you know, work at um, Harvard, and now he's the head of AIDS research for the federal government. Uh, ben Hewitt wrote a book recently called Homegrown, it's about how his two boys developed an intense interest in trappers and in the woods around them. And, you know, when you read the book, they're often talking to other farmers and neighbors who are much older than them and learning about the world of nature in incredibly deep ways. And my friend Aiden Carey, who's um, now, now in her late 20s, when she was a child, she was in, so involved in theater, she would do theater everywhere, every sort of, you know, community theater, university, theater, homeschool groups, she was in, in a mall. And adults, yeah, when she did community theater, very often she was one of the few children involved in it because that, that tended to be a nighttime event for adults. Um, she got along great with them and, and it worked out very well for her. So th there's many different ways of getting around, around this. Um, the next big question, not question, statement, I'm bored. We've all heard this, I'm sure. Well, what do you do? I can tell you, based on my experience, the one thing you don't want to do is start is to tell them what to do. If they say, I'm bored, don't say, well, go out and ride your bike or do such and such. The better thing is to let them stew for a bit and figure out for themselves what to do next. You can certainly say, and I, and I recommend you do. I mean, you don't want to be a, you know, um, what's the word, distant from them, but you don't want to become the entertainment director for them. You know, that, that's, the you know, next thing you know, there you are. You're, you're, you're the school teacher. You're, you're the center of attraction. You know, well, I'm bored. Let's go for entertainment. You know, let's go, let's go for direction. We need, this is self-directed learning. We're trying to encourage that in our children. And when they say, I'm bored, this is a great opportunity for them to make choices and to learn what is a good choice and a bad choice for them. Certainly, you can say, would you like me to give you some ideas on what you could do right now? 
And usually, after they hear that once and you give them your ideas, they know pretty much what your routine is going to be when you say that. <laughs> like, ride your bike, read a book, turn off the TV and get some fresh air, blah, blah, blah. So they're not going to ask that, that. But let them figure stuff out. Let, make sure that there's stuff around the house. John Holt, I remember Colfax has talked about borrowing boxes of books from their public library. And their kid, uh, and the kids would just go through them. They had no intention. And the reason the library let them take boxes of books, by the way, is because they lived so far from it, up in the mountains, that they had a special arrangement because it was so hard for them to get back and forth. So they had a month to return all their books. But they note in their in, in their books about their homeschooling experiences, their boys never went through all the books there. They never read all of them, and you know they were just pick and choose and some sometimes they would go all the way through them most often they just pick and choose but it was them going through it they had something to do you know there's stuff around the house um, I know that uh, some home unschoolers refer to this as strewing if you need a term for it that's a good one but you know like I said it, it's just something that 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 I think if you have a house and children in it it's just a natural occurrence anyway you know, toys are around, books and stuff, you know. And um, I think it's important to let them know that they have access to this and they should figure it out on their own. I mean, give them ideas if you must, but don't become the entertainment director. You know, there's this fear that, you know, oh, well, then all they're going to do is watch TV all day or use a computer all day. And you know what? If you're, if you're comfortable with that, let them do it. You know, that's okay. They'll get bored of that. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And as long as they have other options and they're not depressed, they will start to seek those out. You know? But if if not, and those are the, you know, you got to think, what are the examples that I'm providing my child with of what I do in my spare time? If using the computer and watching TV is all you do, well, may, maybe together you can now develop some other interests. You know, it's awful hard for, for a child, especially in a homeschool situation, yeah, you know, to yeah, you know, to to see a variety of uh, other people doing different things in their parents, unless the parents make that effort to get the kids out of the house. That that's that neither home nor school slide. Yeah, you know, remember that. You know, but um, you know, provide for your child. You you know, you can take them outdoors for play and hiking. Ask them to help around the house. You can ride bikes together, skateboard, do things with them to show them the possibilities. That's all fine. You're doing things together, you know. And you might find that doing this will inspire you to continue doing these things. But don't don't fall into the trap of doing these things because your child said they're bored. You're doing them because you want to do them too. And you say, all right, why don't you join me? Subtle difference, but a big difference in how all this stuff plays out. And before I get to your questions. The last thing I want to point out is it's okay to say no. A lot of people, you know, get get hung up on this because you know I, I I can't tell you how many times I've been to an unschooling conference and during the Q and A, someone who's new to unschooling will say, "Doesn't anybody here ever say no to their children?" And that always struck me as, as an interesting comment because. If no is your default, it does lose its meaning. But, you know, John was, John Holt wrote about this in Teacher Rome and several other places. That, you know, children will respect your no if you respect theirs. I mean, if it's not going to endanger their health or welfare, and if you ask a child to do something and it's a legitimate choice, which is why you're asking them, and they say no, Respect that. It's okay. You know? And the same thing, you know, back. Um, you know, as, as Holt writes in Teach Your Own, yes and no. Both are words. Both convey ideas which even tiny children are smart enough to grasp. One says, we don't do it that way. The other says, that's the way we do it. Most of the time, that is what children want to find out except when overcome by fatigue or curiosity, excitement or passion, children want to do right, do as we do, to fit in, to take part. We can work with this. We can, we can make this 
a very important part of our relationships by just taking this this word no and me using it meaningfully and not in this knee jerk reaction being kind and gentle about it instead of harsh i know and we all get uh, upset you know we're all going to lose our temper and so on but accepting no from a child the same way we want them to accept the no from us is, is I think, an important aspect of, of building your relationship with your child. So now I'd like to open it up to your questions. Um, you know, those, to me, are some of the most common ones I've heard. Um, what are some that, that you have? Do we have any questions, Steve? So, Pat, I'm just turning the Q&A back on because I was concerned that it might actually be part of the issue with the Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. I had to drop off twice. To have things come back correctly, oh, it will take. A, there's a there's a lag as people in the chat um, uh, see this about a minute after we're live. So I've opened the Q and A again. Okay. Uh, those of you who are in the live room, you can you should be able to to click on the Q and A. I think it's up toward the top right, and you should be able to ask some questions. Pat, what what? experiences do those who are homeschooling have that are the most emotionally debilitating? When, when someone's homeschooling, what are some of the, the emotional hurdles that they experience? Well, a common one that, that I've heard of and that I, we had to deal with was grandparents. You know, just, they, you know, first of all, you know, they didn't like that we talked with our children so much. <laughs> you know, they say you give your children too many choices. You just pick them up and do it. You know, and that's the attitude of the world. You know, that's just the way it is. It seems. You know, but people don't realize that that's not a really good way to have a relationship with children. So you know, dealing with the grandparents and and you know, and the way that we we did is we had to uh, for you know some of them very patiently explain why we're doing this time and time again. And as the children, as our girls got older, and they saw that they were nice people and reasonable and conversational and smart, a lot of those fears started to go away. But interestingly enough, I think the grandparents still do it by comparison, like they're comparing it to their friends' children and so on. And of course, you know that that's who they are. But yeah, the grandparents and 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 you know. Criticizing how you raise your family, especially if you decide to, you know, to go whole foods or change your diet as well, it all seems like a rejection of them. Oh, our, not only is going to school not good enough for you, but you don't even want to cook the same food I made for you, you know. And so they take this very personally, um, and and that's that's a, a difficult thing to get over, and and certainly you know one of the challenges. Um, and, and another one I think is that the kids themselves, largely, you know. If they were in school, I think it happens sooner. And if they haven't been in school, it happens. It, it happens eventually. You know, I, I can't say it's going to happen in a particular grade or something, but I have noticed it with our own daughters and, and many of the other children I've known. And that is, they start comparing themselves to the kids in school and find themselves lacking. They feel that if they don't know the same things that the kids in school do, they're dumb. And this can be, uh, you know, something that you have to work through with them and talk about how they they don't know how to speak Japanese, but you're taking Japanese lessons, you know, and that's okay. You know, if we sent you to such and such a school, if we went to a Waldorf school, you wouldn't be learning to read until you were older. As you know, a lot of boys in homeschooling face that issue when you know they get criticized either by adults or other kids for not being able to read well um, at younger at the younger ages. So. You know, this, the comparison things, I think, are a real big challenge that, that you know, we, we all have to deal with, um, both children and adults in homeschool. So if you have a question for Pat, you should be able to find the Q&A module. I think it's, uh, we don't see the same screen that you do, but as I recall, it's toward the top right. There should be some way for you to click on that and to submit a question. Uh, Aaron asks, how do you find balance between independent thinking and reacting versus respectful submission? Well, by respectful submission, I'm assuming you mean that they're choosing to submit to the master. You know, um, Illich talked about this a lot. The master-pupil relationship and how 
it's an unequal relationship. It automatically is. So what you need to do in order to feel good about that is willingly submit to the master. Respectfully, it's like if you're in a dojo and the sensei, you know, you respect the sensei because he's the sensei. He could he could throw you all around the room and he shows you how to, how to, how to do this. And so you respect his skill and you willingly submit because you want to pick up that skill. But if by respectfully submit you mean just because you said so, then that becomes an issue because, you know, why, why would I submit to your authority if I don't believe that, that you deserve this respect, you know? And that's a deep issue. I can't, you know, I mean, it's going to vary from, fam, you know, from instance to instance on what, what, those issue, what that issue is, you know, about respect. But I do find that you know children do want to fit in, and that they will like take on difficult things and submit to uh, rigorous training schedules or piano lessons, you know, um, you know, computer programming sessions when they want. You know, I think a lot of the problem comes when we think you know you don't know you need this yet, but if you learn computer programming now. You know, when you're an older person, this is really, really going to help you. And if that kid doesn't want to do that, and you're upset that they're not respectfully submitting to, to your suggestion, that's, you know, I mean, that becomes an issue. Because respect is a two-way street. And, you know, if the child doesn't feel the respect and love from the parent, you know, that, that makes them feel safe to express themselves, I think it, it comes back in these, you know, little... You know, rebellions, you know, where, where, you know, the very things that Holt talked about and how children fail that take place in private schools all the time, where they yes the teacher to death just to get them off their back, where they smile and nod and, you know, pretend to give an answer and then you say, oh, you're close, blah, blah, you know, and, and it's just this insincere relationship. And so I, I think you really need to, to work with the child's um, abilities and interests in order to earn their respect. And if they, they respect you just because, you know, you are their parent, of course, because you're taking care of them and, and hopefully loving them so that, you know, they will respect you back that way. But, you know, if there's, there's a broken relationship between parent and child, homeschooling gives you the opportunity to fix it, you know, but you have to make the effort. You just can't keep demanding of your child that they listen to you. You, you have to listen to them. You know, why you know, why aren't you listening to me? What's going on? Why don't you want to do this? And it could be difficult. Children aren't always articulate, you know, and so it could take some time. But you need to to work on that. And I, you know, I would say work on that more so than whatever the actual issue is of the subject that they're not studying at that time or, or the action that they're not doing. Um, I, so, it, Matt, if I'm, if I'm hearing that answer for the first time, that could feel confusing to me, mm -hmm. and my guess is that a lot of this would feel confusing. So, how do parents who are starting homeschooling deal cope with sort of their own personal confusion around what they believe, mm -hmm. how they interact with their children? Um, isn't there uh, sort of the potential for enormous amount of self doubt and kind of feeling like I don't know what to do? <laughs> I'm, I'm so used. To, to being in control. Right. Well, you know, certainly if that, you know, if that's the way you're used to doing it, if, if it's like, you know, the Von Trapp family and the sound of music, you know, the captain blows the whistle and the kids line up and, and you know, that's, that's what you mean by respect and that's how you want to do it. Well, you know, you're, you're, there, there are problems that you, you create by setting up that way, but if everyone buys into it and it's working, okay. But what what I think you need to do is is work with your child and 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 not on them. And by that I mean you talk with them about why they don't want to do things. And and by the way, about the importance of why, as a family, you know, we want to do something together and get them on board with that too. It's not just a whole bunch of individuals flying off in every way. That's a, a sure recipe for a parent to get confused, you know. Um, so I would say that, you know, the doubts that a parent has, 
were, could be allayed by if you're if you're an unschooler and you're you know you you're you know depending on where on the unschooling spectrum you are too. You know, if you're a radical unschooler and you say anything my, my kid wants to do is, is going to be fine, you know, within certain, you know, boundaries, which are quite, <laughs> the parameters are quite, quite wide, it, you know, it's not going to be as much of an issue. But if you're, you're an unschooler that, that feels, I, you know, I, I will unschool anything except math. I, I insist my child, you know, to learn math. But otherwise, yeah, I get all this other stuff. Um, you know, you, you can have that when your child starts to push back on the math part of it. You know, and, and on that I would say, talk to other parents who've been there. Um, talk, you know, read, there's there's a lot more literature, there's a lot of stuff online, and not all of it is good, unfortunately, online or in print, because I mean, I mean, it, it's people's opinions, it, it's their own stories, and I and frankly, I find a lot of the research, you know, on the issue to be, you know, not not all that helpful because they they just tend to echo the standard child rearing practices. You know, The Continuum Concept by Gene Leadloff, if there's only one book that you read, and it's not even a homeschooling book, but I would recommend that book you know, to get an idea of what it can be like to have a different sort of relationship in your family among your, your children and, and the, the adults than you know, the conventional, you know, I'm, I'm the, the boss and you're the, <laughs> you're the, the, the little kid that's got to listen to me. Did, did, did I make that any clearer or did I muddy it even further? No, I, I mean, this is a great topic, and if someone else has a question and we need to go to a different topic, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. What was the name of the book? The Continuum Concept. Continuum by Concept. Love. So I'm a new homeschooler or an unschooler, and I've uh, been unhappy with how my child's uh, school experience has been, so I pull my child out of school, and then I'm faced with all of these questions, am I homeschooling, am I unschooling, what do I do about math, um, I, how do I get past feeling overwhelmed? First of all, take a deep breath, <laughs> very important to breathe, <laughs> especially around young active children, so that you can center yourself, be centered before you try to make big, big choices and decisions. And then, I, I think, Ask yourself, how important is it at, at this point? You know, is it really worth getting upset that my, you know, second grader is not uh, writing cursive properly or does not do um, grade level math at that point? I mean, I would say, what is the worst that would happen if they didn't learn that? And I think if you play that out in your head, that sometimes that, that, that will relax you. Because there's many examples of people who did very poorly in school in math. Um, you know, uh, I, don't, I, I, I know that um, Edison was particularly poor in school. And, and you know, there's a lot of people that, that you can cite. You know, um, Jamie McMillan's book about, um, I think, Legendary Learning, it's called. Um, you know, she, she has many examples, and so that, that might help calm you down to realize that there's many, many paths into adulthood and into, you know, really good learning experiences. It doesn't just have to be, you know, what we got from school that we're trying to reproduce at home or that we're trying to do as unschoolers. You know, I mean, what worked for the Colfax is, I mean, if I put dairy goats in my backyard, I don't think my kids would have any interest in them, you know? I mean, it's just not going to work for them, you know? So everyone has to, to take a deep breath and say, well, what's the worst that can happen? Why, why not let my child do X, Y, what they want to do? Sail around the world. You know, that's something that you know, a lot of teenagers, not a lot, but a fair number of homeschool teenagers have done. Um, you know, um, and their parents were probably scared stiff when they were first told this, unless the parents, of course, were sailors too. But that's not always the case. So, you know, I would, I would definitely say, Get a handle on on what's the worst that that can happen, and, and 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 calm yourself down on that. But if it is really something bad, then you need to to figure figure that out with your spouse, or better yet, or or, or, or spouse, or if you don't have a spouse, to the, the friend uh, who's either a homeschooler or maybe a parent, a grandparent, an in-law, someone who you trust and knows your child, so you could talk about this because you need you need someone to talk with. You need, I mean, there's homeschooling consultants and stuff, and I do this too, but I always feel like 
I'm a paid best friend in that situation. You know, if you have a best friend, whether they're homeschooling or not, just hearing about your distraught often and just venting it can can often help clarify for you what's going on, and, and your friend can help reflect it back. You know, and help you 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 see what's really going on. Um, so building up a network of people that can do that, and then online. You know, I, I know that there's a ton of support groups out there. You know, in fact, it's not uncommon. Uh, I, I I I watched the uh, unschooling group on Facebook. It's not uncommon to see questions like that come across. Um, you know, questions like, I, "I'm ready to smack my kid. I, he's driving me crazy. How do I pull back? They you know they won't do anything that I say." You know. So the the and and this is true of, of children in school too. You know, this is just you know this is a commonality that we all share. Those of us who have children, you know, and and so we we need to to break out of our silos and reach out and, and seek some more help. Um, because I find that talking about it with others, either those who have been there or those who are going through it now, or those who are like John Holt who didn't have children but who are really you know good child observers. And they can really, sometimes an un a disinterested third party can give you a much better insight into the dynamics of what's going on with you and your children than your, your spouse or a close friend. So don't neglect talking about your issues with other people. Um, and if you've you got to do it anonymously, online can help. There are uh, other places. But that, I think, is something that is homeschooling and unschooling grows that, that we're going to see more and more in need of. Uh, is more, you know, I mean, Growing Without Schooling served that function for many years. Where parents would write back and forth to one another about, you know, their, their woes and challenges. We had a, a thing called Challenges and, and, and Concerns, which is what I, I use as a title for this. Uh, that was actually a column in Growing Without Schooling for many years. So other parents can share their wisdom uh, with you. And those of us who've been there, I mean, our children are different, our situations are different, but you might just gain enough insight and you know from our experience to learn about how it can inform your experience and make it easier. I think there's some additional nuance to Aaron's question. His original question was the balance between independent thinking and reacting versus respectful submission. Mm -hmm. So he made an additional comment. He said that's helpful but in a situation where at church the children's classes are set up a lot like traditional school and my child's independent thought and comments can cause certain teachers to shut the child down as they aren't used to that kind of relation. Hmm. I wonder if he's getting at kind of how you prepare your child to be in different environments. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for clarifying that and, and Steve for you know, explicating it. The, um, yeah, that, that's a good one. And when, you know, we've had to tell our girls, you know, because we've always maintained a swinging door yeah, you know, we've told them that there's a swinging door between our home and the school. But, and that mean that meant that when you left, if you wanted to leave school, you can get out. You can just leave. Uh, you know. But when you're in school, you're playing by their rules, not our rules, not your rules, their rules. And that's why we're homeschooling you because we don't like their rules. But you know, this is the way school runs. And I think you can make a similar argument about uh, Sunday school. Um, certainly, we found that with our girls, <clears throat> um, you know, when uh, they were attending um, Sunday school, we were Roman Catholic, and um, yeah, the, the but the the situation what was was you know our girls were not ready to well my youngest was <laughs> our youngest one pushed back, <laughs> but. And we're getting we're getting difficulties, but and, and that was true in school too when she went, you know, for the two or three weeks that she went. But um, more often than not, and that's because she had a great sense of injustice that she felt an injustice was being done to her. But the our other two girls knew how to play the game, and that's exactly what we told them. So maybe this would help you too, Erin. Is you know say look, there's a thing called the school game, and in school they only let you talk if you raise your hand, and then only if you get called on. And guess what? They may not call on you if so many kids have their hands up. You know, and just run through the rules of school and say, you know, this is how Sunday school is run. And, you know, and if we're going to be part of this, they're not going to do it the way we do it at home. And lots of places don't do it the way we do it at home. And, you know, if you ever went to school, you'd see that this is the case. So, you know, 
And also, perhaps, if there's a way to talk to the teachers there to say, you know, we have a less formal setup, and but I could almost hear their response, you know, but because um, they won't, don't want to make an exception for your child. You know, this is the way they've always taught. They've probably been teaching this class for years in, in certain ways. So, yeah, I would really work on coaching the, your child and children to, you know, Except that if they're going to be part of these mainstream classes, this is how mainstream classes work. And it's a game, you know, that it's like a little ritual. And you can play it and, and, and get out of it and then get on with your life. That it's just this one hour or, or however long it is on Sunday that, that you, you, you need to do this in order to participate in this community. And then you can also point out that, like, if you took karate lessons or music lessons or, you know, any type of cooking class, you would have to follow those rules of those teachers too in there and that you know not everyone runs their their class the way we run our home so making that distinction might be useful for your children and and for you i mean that that's that's how we dealt with it Aaron. <laughs> okay we've got just a couple of minutes left if you have a question for pat you can put it in the q and a aaron says that is very helpful coaching them thank you so if anybody else has a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, Pat, what about support groups? What are, what's the best way for someone to look or build a support group for their experience? Well, first, find the local homeschoolers and get to know them because they're going to tell you what the, lo the local groups are. Also, you could do a, a Google search, of course. But, you know, when, once you get there, you may find, as, as some do, that this is the greatest place for me. These people are my soulmates, or eh, not all of them. You know, there's too many school at home people here for me. I, I don't really feel like I'm part of this crowd. But what's important is you make these contacts, and you you know, so so you see the group there, so you can make other contacts, and then you put up a flag, say, hey, anybody want to come to my house and discuss this book, um, or discuss this this curriculum idea, or uh, some sort of travel uh, experience that, that, that we have for kids, or some field trips that I might want to do. And then you just build your own support network that way. And again, just as I said earlier about children, not you know, sometimes your best friends and best helpers in homeschooling are not other homeschoolers. You may find that, that you, know, you really you know, have a child that, that's thoroughly into tap dancing, and, or, or, or you know, computer programming, or mathematics. Um, science, and that everyone in your support group, or most of the people there, are more more like art people, or write into writing and editing and so on, music, and so you've got you, you could just put up a flag and say, look, you know, I I, I, I want to have a maker space in my living room. You know, anyone want to join me? And then you know that becomes your support group for that. But it's always good to stay in touch with all the the mainstream support groups that are out there, so that you know. First of all, what opportunities are coming up? Because sometimes there are like statewide and national contests, or just events that you might be interested in for your, your, your you and your children. And then secondly, for the smaller, more local things, like you know they're going to do a play, or or we're going to try and have Ultimate Frisbee Day on, on Friday, and those are really important things to know too. So don't neglect your, your, the existing support groups, but if they don't work for you, don't be scared at all about going out and starting your own. That's, that's how all these support groups got started in the first place. Okay, Pat, I think we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much. My pleasure. We're going to go ahead and wrap up now. The recording will be available live online for 24 hours if you'd like the whole set of Pat's Starting to Homeschool series. You can go to startingtohomeschool.com to home, starting and look for the link to buy the series. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Take care. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everybody.